Okay. So we have got three lectures left in the semester, 19, 20, 21. What that means is everything that needs to be tied up, loose ends, I'm going to tie it up, tie it up in the last uh, three classes. So I uh, am requesting your patience a little bit. So if you have to go a little bit over time, please stay with me. Um, I'm going to try to keep it as <laughs> close. No, when you get close to the finish line, you have seen Olympics. When you get finished to the, you run faster. No? Yeah. Even works for the marathon, right? <laughs> All right, so it's not, it, it has nothing to do with fast or slow. It just has to do with the content that you may need for your higher classes. So if I don't give it to you here, then you're not doing justice for your uh, future technical electives. So if we need to go a little bit over, please stay with me, this is a request. Uh, next, today's lecture is going to be interesting. Uh, why? Because we are going to tie math to some real world feedback systems. So I'm excited about today's lecture. At the end of it, I have uh, a YouTube uh, video on which there is a demo. I can't do the demo, but I have a video that has the demo. Uh, so I'm excited about that. That's going to be our last thing that we talk about today, feedback systems. But before that, we are going to look at transforming filters. So in the last class, we looked at designing a Third order Butterworth filter. We had three poles in the left half, three poles in the right half. Right half unstable, we threw it out. We considered only the three poles in the left half plane. So we designed the third order Butterworth filter. We'll try to transform it today. And then we'll look at second order systems, meaning the order of the polynomial in the denominator for a transfer function is two. We'll take a look at how do those uh, systems respond in time domain. In general, if you have a third order Butterworth filter, you can extend it to n order Butterworth filter. All you would have to do is increase the power of your omega to 2 raised to n. Right? So in the previous class, when uh, we had a third order, 2n was 6. Now we have 2n. So what this means is, if you have an nth order Butterworth filter, this is a low pass filter, you tell me what is the cutoff that you are interested in, omega c, and I will tell you where the poles are. So they are going to be two n poles. Half of them are going to be my stable poles. So I'm going to throw away all the poles in the right half. I'm just going to have n poles that are in the left half plane. And I can tell you where they are exactly. How do I find that out? Well, I simply need to find the values of omega for which the denominator goes to zero, right? So those are going to be my poles. So I'm going to set my denominator going to zero. I'm going to find the omegas that will make that happen. So I'll find out that the poles of this nth order Butterworth filter are omega c away from the origin. Right? Omega c is the desired cutoff frequency for that low pass filter. But they are all at a certain angle away from each other. In the previous class, we had 60 degrees separation between each pole. Right? The whole 360 degrees was split up into how many? Uh, six poles. So each was 60 degrees away. Now it is going to be two n poles, n of them right half, n of them in the left half. And they are all going to be omega c away and equal distance away from each other. Now the angles are going to be pi over 2 multiplied by 1 plus 2k plus 1 divided by n, where k is what? k is going from 0 to uh, cap n for nth order. Uh, sorry, so 0 to 2n minus 1 because we are looking at poles for the two end. Half of them will throw away, all the ones that are in the right half. So given a cutoff frequency, you know where the poles are, you will be able to design the uh, nth order Butterworth filter. Designing an nth order Butterworth filter, what does that involve? It involves giving a frequency response, or a transfer function. Right? So all you're doing is, if I know the poles, I will just find the, uh, I'll factorize all those poles, omega minus omega one, omega minus omega two, and so on, it gives me my frequency response. Now let's take a look at how do you take a low pass filter, give me a band pass filter. Okay, why are you talking about only the low pass filter and the band pass filter? Why are you not talking about the high pass filter? Why are you not talking about the band stop filter? Well, the reason is this. 
how do you go from a low pass filter to a high pass filter? Just do a one minus low pass filter. In the frequency domain, you do a one minus low pass filter, you get a high pass filter. And similarly, you do a one minus the band pass filter, you get a band stop filter. So if I'm taking care of the low pass to the band pass, then I'm taking care of all the four possibilities. So let's take a look at what I need to do to the poles of my system if I wanted to take a low pass filter and consider that as my prototype. That's where you're starting. And you want to transform this filter into a band pass filter. So first things, if you desire a band pass filter, you will ask for two things at least. What is that? One is, what is the resonant frequency of this band pass filter, center frequency, which is essentially what? It is the geometric mean of the low cutoff multiplied by the high cutoff, omega L and omega H, geometric mean of that. The next thing that you will ask is, what is the bandwidth of my band pass filter? Bandwidth of the band pass filter indicated by cap B, which is omega H minus omega L. So given those two things, you know what that band pass filter should look like. You wouldn't care too much about the gain because then that is just going to be an amplitude scaling. You can, if you assume one, then you can make that into any other value. That transformation is pretty easy to accomplish. But the question, real question is, if you have a low pass filter that has been designed for some omega C, right, some cutoff frequency omega C, how can you transform it to a band pass filter for the desired resonant frequency and bandwidth? The answer lies in this particular transformation. Now, this particular transformation is being derived using circuit elements, right? How would you, des how would you design a low-pass filter using circuit elements? Well, you will have a L and a C. How would you design a band-pass filter? Again, you will have a L and a C, but you will have a resonant frequency. You will have a uh, RLC or LC that will be designed in such a way that they resonate. Using those circuit elements, you can actually derive this particular transformation. We are not going to, go ahead. One minus is not inverse, one minus, one minus negative? What do you mean negative? So one minus the, in frequency, right? So I did it in frequency. If you have a low pass filter and you have one in frequency, both in frequency, you do a one minus the low pass filter, you get a high pass filter, right? Those are, those are in frequency. Uh, next, so this is the transformation. What is omega zero? Omega zero, we highlighted in blue. That is the resonant frequency of the desired band pass filter. What is B? B is the bandwidth of the desired band pass filter. What is S? S is the complex frequency variable. Uh, let me use red for this. S is whatever, complex frequency variable, sigma plus g omega. But now there are two complex frequency variables, right? One is for the low pass filter, one is for the band pass filter. So we need to differentiate that. So instead of using S for the low pass filter, I will use P. P is S for low pass filter. So think of P as the complex variable, but you are using that for the low pass filter. P standing for prototype. What is omega C? Omega C is your cutoff frequency. So you design a low pass filter first for a certain omega C, then you transform it to a band pass filter for a given omega zero and B. What is a P plane? What is a P? P plane is the S plane that corresponds to the low pass filter for the prototype. All right, P is S, but for low pass filter, the, the, because I'm already using, okay, so there is complex variable, frequency variable for the band pass filter and one for the low pass filter. I need to be able to differentiate which one is for what. So I use P for the prototype, the low pass filter, that's where you're starting, and you use S for the band pass filter, that's where you're trying to go to. Hopefully with, with a so example, this will be clear, but think of P as S, but for the prototype filter. Um, now, let's take a look at what happens to poles when you make this transformation. If you substituted P equals zero here, what would happen? You would get two values for S, plus and minus J omega. 
So one pole in the p-plane is actually two complex conjugate poles in the s-plane. So if you have one pole in the low pass filter, you actually get two poles for the band pass filter. Similarly, when you substitute infinity, you get, again, values of s and zero. Uh, s is zero and infinity. What that essentially means is, if you have one pole in the p-plane, think of it as the s-plane, but for the low pass, you actually have two poles for the band pass filter in the s-plane. Right? One pole is shooting off to two. Um, so what is the vertical axis here? It's j omega, right? So think about how are you increasing and decreasing with respect to j omega? Low, high, low, right? That's a band pass filter. How about here? Low, high, low, high, like that. With respect to the vertical axis. That's giving you that band pass filter characteristic. You guys see that? One shooting off to two. Uh, related to the transformation using this particular equation. So, once you know this, the derivation is not provided over here. I do have the math that supports it if you're interested, but I, let's not spend time using uh, L and C elements to derive that particular equation. Let's just use it. Now, what we have in here is an example. You're starting off with a low pass filter and you're trying to design, you're transforming it to a band pass filter. So the question is, transform a third order Butterworth filter. Your cutoff frequency is given, omega c is given. I'm simply using the band pass filter frequency response, oh, sorry, not frequency, transfer function as b of p. Remember I said b of s, I'm not using s, I'm using p for the prototype filter. p is s, but for low pass. So all the things are in, expressed in p over here. Wait, how did I get this? In the previous class, we derived the third order low pass filter. With omega c being one, it is exactly this. Next, I want to design what? A band pass filter. What is the center frequency? What is the resonant frequency? What is the bandwidth? Res bandwidth, I want it to be two, and I want the omega not to be five, Cent resonating at five. What I, I will use is this particular transformation. P equals S squared plus 25, divided by 2s. It is exactly coming from that particular equation over there. So all the p's over here will be substituted by that. I know. The 2s and the 25, again, yeah. So I, there is no way for me to get around that, I think. Uh, so what is the pole zero diagram for b of p? B of P is what? Corresponding to the low pass filter. Where are the poles? There are three of them in the left half, omega C away from the origin, 60 degrees apart. One, 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 oh, sorry, one. They're all 60 degrees away. This is at 120, 180, 240. It's in the complex plane, so you can write out, okay, what is this going to be? Negative one. What is that going to be? Well, it's going to be negative half plus J square root 302. And then over here, negative half minus J square root 3 over 2. They're all on the uh, S plane or P plane in this case. It is for the low pass filter. Each pole here will shoot off and become two, right? So this is going to give me two poles. This is going to be two poles. This is going to be two poles. At the end, when I design the corresponding band pass filter after the transformation, instead of getting three, I will get six poles. Let's just find out where those poles are going to be. All I need to do what? Do this, right? So I'll take this transformation and substitute in my B of P. What do I get? I get that. Of course I get that. So, right, save time, I cleaned it up, I put it as a polynomial in S. Uh, what I have is this, P substituted for S squared plus 25 divided by 2S, simplify in such a way that you get a rational transfer function for the band pass filter. This is for the band pass filter. And now I'm using S instead of P, right? P was for prototype. Now I have this. What do I have here? I have six poles, right? Six is the highest power of S here. So three had to become six, and it, it, this is supporting that. I need to figure out where those six poles are. One way of doing this is what? Plug this into MATLAB or maybe some particular computer program that gives you the roots of the sixth order polynomial. That's one way of doing it. But there's another way of doing it as well, which is far more easier, even by doing by hand. What is that? I know that each pole over here gives me two poles, right? And I know the location of the poles. What is that? 
here, here, and here. So I can put, put one pole, the location here, find the corresponding two values of S for the first one, second one, third one. Do it, finding poles of bandpass filter. When you have pole at negative one, where is this guy? Pole negative one is right here, right? Find that. Use the transformation, find the corresponding two values of S. You've got complex conjugate poles. Similarly, do that for this guy and this guy. And where are they? They are here and blue one here. Omega C away, 60 degrees from each other. How did you solve for the poles? Exactly this way. Uh, how did I solve for the poles where? In the low pass or the band pass? Low pass where uh, derived in the previous class, right? Omega C away from the center, all at equal angles. The poles which were negative one and those two imaginary ones. Huh? So the, the low pass filter correspond to the band, uh, Butterworth derivation that we did in the previous class. Let me pull that up. I don't know if it is uh, 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 signals and systems. Uh, Somewhere here it is hidden. Uh, I think it's going to be over here, right? So in the last class, this was the last slide, right? So if you have a third order Butterworth filter, the left half is going to give you those three poles that are stable when you get these three values. Where are they? At how, what is the distance and what is the angle? That's all you need to know. Distance is going to be omega C. Where is that? Uh, because the amp magnitude of this S only depends on omega c. All the other things are just contributing to the angle. So you get what, uh, omega c away, omega c away, omega c away. In our example that we were doing, omega c was one. So they were one away, one away, one away. But what is about the angles? A equals zero corresponds to this, pi over two plus pi over six. What is that? 90 plus 30, 120 is right here. One away at 120 degrees away from the horizontal axis, you know that value has to be negative half plus square root three over two J, right? And then you get the next one and you get the next one. Alan, does that help? So aren't the poles of P, P equals S squared plus 25 divided by two S. Yes, but that's how I find the values of S, right? So that is the transformation. That is not my low pass. So I first designed my low pass filter, Butterworth, and then I use the transformation equation that you just wrote, S squared plus 25 divided by two S, to get the values of S, to design the band pass filter. Good. You didn't have to. That was just done. Uh, not to scare, but just to say, all right, you could get it up in, in a situation where you have a very high order polynomial in the denominator, but don't think of it as don't think of it as solving that complex equation. Instead, use one pole shooting up to two. Use the transformation equation to find the poles. Go ahead. Uh, if you you want the only way you you would want to use this polynomial is if it was for some arbitrary uh, transfer function. There was no context like, yeah, you're designing a low pass, then you're doing a transformation. If that context wasn't there, if you're just given the transfer function and said, find the poles, then you are breaking your head. Actually not breaking your head, putting it into MATLAB and finding the roots. Go ahead. No. No. Not on the exam. Uh, if it is on the homework, I highly recommend using MATLAB to solve that. You know how to do that, right? What is the function that you would use? Which one? There's a simple MATLAB function to do it. What is that? Roots. Roots, you give it in the square brackets, all the coefficients. What are the coefficients? 1, 4, 83, 2, 0, 8, and so on. Put it in a vector form. Roots of that vector. It'll pop out six, six roots. Okay, next. So we've got two poles for the first pole in low pass. For the second one, we got two. For the third one, we got two. In total, we got six. Where are they? Right here. 
they are all in the left half plane. What is the center frequency of our desired band pass filter? Pi. Look at where these are. Pi. Negative pi. The vertical axis is the omega, right? Uh, what is the bandwidth? Two. Two. You've designed a band pass filter that resonates at five radians per second with a bandwidth of two radians per second. Each pole shooting off to two poles. Uh, let's see. All right, so here. This is exactly how you would solve it in MATLAB. Roots is the function that will allow you to do it. And you just give it the argument of all the coefficients of that S. And will spit out all the six roots. And when you plot it, it will look like that. And you can also plot it using MATLAB. So find the roots. The real part of the roots is sigma. Imaginary parts of the roots are omega. Plot your real versus imaginary with a marker of x. And we'll give you all the whole zero plot. Something if you are interested in trying out, you can try that out. Questions? So first design low pass, then you transform it to a band pass. Designing low pass, what do I need to tell you to design a low pass filter? Two things, type, but what? Cut off frequency, omega c. You write and order, right? You need to know the order. Because only if you know the order, you know the separation of angles between the poles. Once you get the low pass filter, then you can transform it to the band pass filter. New two things I have to say. Bandwidth, resonant frequency. Questions? Next. Uh, let's talk about the second order system. So the question is, if you have a second order polynomial in the denominator for any transfer function, what does the response of that particular system look like? So what we have over here is the transfer function for a second order system. What makes it a second order system is the denominator polynomial in S has the highest power of S as two. So D of S has two roots. Those are the two poles for H of S. So you will see a S squared term in the denominator. There is a standard form for second order systems. It is this. H of S is omega n squared, omega n standing for natural frequency of the, the oscillations that exist in uh, second order systems, divided by a quadratic in S. Quick question, what if the quadratic equation, the numerator or the denominator is not in this form? What do you do then? Uh, panic is one. So you start with panic. What is the second? How do you respond to next? So you wouldn't need to do partial fractions. So suppose you have um, something like, all right, so you would need to do partial fraction only if there is a S term in the numerator or maybe a S squared term in the numerator. But what if there is no S in the numerator? What if it's just constant in the numerator? Go ahead. Quadratic formula. No, you, you are not even trying to factorize here, right? So the question is, what if you are given a second order system, H of S, but it is not in this form. You, you see, observe here, what does this form mean? The constant over here and the numerator over here should exactly the, be the same. Omega n squared there, omega n squared there. What if they're not? What if this is twice that amount? What do you do then? Manipulate the equations to make it the same, right? So you've got to manipulate your quadratic in the denominator on your man, numerator, manip so first panic, then you say, all right, I can manipulate it to make it look more like my standard form. Next. Once you do that, once you manipulate it to be in that particular form, what you can read off are two parameters for the second order system. One is the damping factor. The other one is the natural frequency. When you have, uh, say, a, a ruler, right? You have a ruler, and you put it on a bench, and you flick it, what happens? Oscillation. Do they oscillate forever, or do they os the oscillations die out? When they only die out because of damping, right? The oscillations will die out because of damping, right? The damp zeta is what is controlling that damping. If zeta is very high, that means the oscillations are going to die down very fast. If that zeta is small, damping factor is small, those oscillations are going to remain in the system for a longer time. Next, though, when you flicked it, it was resonating. Right? It, was, it was moving, oscillating at a particular frequency. What is that particular frequency? Well, it could be natural frequency, or it could be damped frequency. 
if there is damping that is involved, then you would call it damped frequency. Natural frequency would be, if there was no damping involved, what would be the frequency of the oscillation? That's a natural frequency. So, two factors, two parameters for the second order system, zeta and omega n. Where is the zeta? Right there. Where is the omega n? Here, here, and here. We have already said, after we panic, we can manipulate equations to be in this way. Once you do it in this way, then you can factor out what is that zeta, what is that omega n. Once you know them, you also know where the location of the poles are going to be, because you can factorize the denominator. You factorize the denominator, you know there are going to be two values of s that will make the denominator go to zero. They are going to be two complex conjugate poles for the system. They both depend on zeta and omega n. Go ahead. All right, let me, let me put another, another problem in that list. Zeta is generally that, but in some textbooks, it's not even that. Sometimes it's that. <laughs> oh, uh, what is that? What is the middle term? Two zeta omega n. No, no, no. The middle term is two zeta omega n s. So you have got the s squared term, then you have the coefficient of s, then you have got your constant, which is omega n squared. Well, for the, for the variants of uh, COVID also, we are choosing delta and lambda and mu and then you, you, you know, with all this uh, pandemic, we will all learn Greek letters. Um, two zeta omega n, yes, and multiplied by s. Okay, so we have got two locations, right? So we've got the poles. The poles depend on zeta and omega n. So the location of the poles is actually being controlled by how much damping is involved in the system and what is the oscillation frequency that is involved. Actually, I can uh, plot it, and also you know that they are complex conjugates of each other. Uh, I can plot it in the S-plane. They look like this. I can change zeta while keeping omega n constant, and I can change omega n while keeping zeta constant. Now let's try to take a look. What happens when you keep one constant and change the other? And this is tied to this. If you keep zeta constant, lines of constant zeta, if you keep zeta constant and only change omega n, what you're changing is uh, you're going on lines, but you're going away. As you increase omega n, the poles are actually going farther away out for a particular zeta. Next, if you keep the constant omega n, but you change zeta, then you are traveling from here to here, and this guy from here to here. Remember, there are two poles, right? So if you, if you say, I will start from here, and I will start from here, both the poles are going to be complex conjugate to each other. Say you start there, and now you are keeping omega n constant, but you are increasing zeta. As you increase zeta, this guy will move this way, this guy will move this way, but it will be on that uh, circle, semi-circle. All right, so, and this is, the, you, can, you can validate this, right? You can, you can fix zeta here and here, change omega n, see what happens, and you can fix omega n here and here, change zeta and see what happens. Essentially, point, plotting those, the, 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 the movement of those, those poles, when you keep one, constant change the other. In one, if you keep constant zeta, then you're moving away. As you increase omega n, you go farther and farther out. But they are going farther out on a line. This is for a particular zeta. That is for a particular zeta. That is for the particular zeta and so on. It's actually dependent on the angle uh, over here. And we'll take a look at that map that supports this. This, this. this guy, cosine theta is actually zeta. Right here. So. For a particular angle of that line, you have that say, one zeta, and you're going further out as you change omega n. Omega n is controlling how far away you are from the origin, 
zeta is controlling at what angle you are away. Next, on the right hand side over here, we have the, the two poles that are plotted. On the left, what did we do? We monitored how those two poles would me move if you fixed one parameter and changed the other. Now we are saying, let us just pick one value of zeta and one value of omega and then just plot it out. So these are two complex conjugate poles for the second order system that have been plotted out. They are both omega in a way. You know that. How do you know that? You go back, take a look. What is the real part here? Omega n. What is the imaginary part over here? Omega n. If you keep the zeta constant, then the, the, the value of that square root will be omega in a way for a particular zeta. Next, both are complex conjugate. So I've got here one, here one. What is the real value? What is the real part of it? Negative sigma omega n. How do you know that? Go back. That's the real value. What is the imaginary part? This is the imaginary part, right? So the, the real part of both the poles is the same, negative zeta omega n. So good, negative part is real. Uh, sorry, real part is negative, stable. And the imaginary part is omega n multiplied by square root of one minus zeta squared. Actually, omega n is called the natural frequency, but when the oscillations are damped, they oscillate at a different frequency. It's called damped frequency. You guys I must have seen this in circuits maybe, yeah, which is called omega d. Omega d is damped frequency. It's actually related to omega n, by, all right, if you guys say so, data squared. So this is actually omega d. So you see this, the imaginary part of this pole is actually omega n multiplied by one minus square root of data squared, which is omega d. But if you just keep going on that semicircle, what is that point? That, what is that point right here? And what is this point? Omega n, right? Radius of the circle has to be omega n here, right? And then over here you would get minus omega n. So essentially, if there is no damping, zeta is zero your oscillations would oscillate at omega n. If there is damping, the oscillations go repeat at omega d, damped frequency, lower than omega n. Uh, next, this angle, which is theta, is related to zeta. So if you just use some basic trigonometry over here, this is zeta omega n, this is omega n, so cosine theta over here should give you zeta. So zeta is controlling which angle of this line you are going on. Omega n is controlling how far you are going. But if you keep zeta constant, you are picking one line, one green line. And similarly, for the semicircle, you are picking one omega n, so some radius. And then as you're changing zeta, you see, okay. As you're changing zeta, the two complex poles are kind of doing that. That them coming close to the vertical axis. Actually, what they do is they come close to the vertical axis they meet on the vertical axis and shoot off in two directions. One goes right, one goes left. We'll talk about that. Uh, as we, so that's how, how poles would go as you increase zeta. Because there's no lower limit of zeta. There's no higher upper limit of zeta. Zeta, the lowest value is zero. But you can keep increasing to infinity. You can keep increasing it. So let me just trace what happens to this pole. You increase zeta, this guy will come here and shoot off this way. And this guy, similarly, will come up here and shoot off this way. And then they go opposite directions. And how do you validate that? Pick a omega n, keep increasing zeta, and monitor the poles. Uh, let's see. Next, damping factor zeta. How does the response look like? And now I'm showing over here some uh, impulse responses, but this could also be the same for step response. So. What I'm doing is I'm keeping omega n constant, which means that I'm picking one particular red semicircle, and I'm changing uh, zeta from zero to zeta greater than one. So zero to one, and then greater than one as well. No upper limit. 
how would the location of the poles change for h of s h of s is your second order system for which you are tracking the location of the poles this is what would happen if zeta is zero zeta is what damping factor make it zero it's an undamped situation and damped situation is what oscillations will keep happening you give it energy an impulse the impulse response will be oscillate 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 or for that matter give it step response give it step the output will be just oscillation what are the oscillations uh, what is the frequency of these oscillations radian frequency of these oscillations is it's undamped what so what should i call it omega n right natural frequency so when zeta is zero you get oscillations in the system it is not unstable behavior right the oscillations are in control it is marginally stable so when you have marginally stable this ties back to our lecture in the previous class marginally stable means you get roots on the vertical axis they cannot be repeated roots but they are distinct roots but they are on the vertical axis so roots on the vertical axis undamped system with oscillations in the response omega n so it's like saying um if i you know if i flicked a pendulum it would forever oscillate i cannot call it stable i would call it marginally stable uh but the oscillation frequency is your natural frequency the resonant frequency for that now as you increase zeta this pole moves this way this pole moves this way right what is that what am i doing here i am increasing the damping in my system how much will it increase well as long as you are between 0 and 1 you would have a underdamped system meaning this pole will move here and then this pole will move here all i'm doing is increasing the damping i'm not making it huge but i'm increasing it so what would happen to these oscillations well they would die out you would get oscillations and you would get damping of those oscillations exponential damping of those oscillations would they repeat at the frequency of these oscillations not going to be natural frequency it's going to be omega d the damped frequency but that's what an impulse response would look like you give it energy it goes up and then dies out what is that is like the same thing right ruler on a board flick it dies out so that's a stable system so what you have got is a stable system because its impulse response is dying out the response in the system is eventually going to zero it will converge and it is inconsistent uh, it's consistent with our conversation about location of the poles left half yeah next what if you increase damping even further well if you increase damping even further make zeta equal to 1 then what you have is a critically damped system where the response shoots up and then dies down very quickly fast decay but you don't see any oscillations in the system that's like saying flick it no oscillations it just dies down right that's zeta equal 1 but what if you even further increase damping when you increase for damping further like i said you had two poles over here both of them together when zeta was 1 you increase zeta further one move pole moves this way the other pole moves this way one guy is moving in the good direction the other guy is in moving in the bad direction but those two would be the poles that are on the real axis corresponding to an overdamped system zeta equals greater than 1 too much damping so what that does is it becomes a slow decay in the system the energy of the system has to stay the same but because you increase the damping what happened the response became very small right that overshoot is very minimal but it stays in the system for a lot the energy stays in the system for a lot longer still no oscillations so those are your four variations under damped sorry undamped let's start undamped undamped underdamped critically damped overdamped how would the response change this is for an impulse response and think will look very similar when you move it to a step response right for a step response instead of going and settling to zero for the impulse response it will settle to a one that would be for the step response questions here location of the poles for the second order system four cases all of them are either stable or marginally stable because all you have zeta cannot be negative omega n cannot be negative the real part is negative zeta omega n so that has to be negative 
Next. Seen this, done this before? Next. <laughs> Let's take a look at an example here. Over here, we don't even have to uh, panic, which means that it is already in the standard form here. Uh, H of S is given to us. 100 divided by S squared plus 10 S plus 100. You right away know omega n. Omega n is 10 radians per second. And uh, 2 zeta omega n is 10, right? So this guy is omega n squared. This guy is omega n squared. And this guy is 10, is what? 2 zeta omega n. So you know zeta from here. You calculate it, it'll come out to half. When zeta is between 0 and 1, you can classify this system as under damped, which means that the oscillations are going to be there, but they are going to be damped. So where are the poles? Well, there are two poles of this system. We know the locations, negative zeta omega n plus or minus, they're complex conjugate poles, j times omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. You know zeta, you know omega n. Why? Because you have compared this H of S with the standard second order system. Find of zeta omega n plug them into our location of the poles, and you get the, those two as the location of the poles, negative 5 plus or minus j 5 square root 3. Plot them out. When you plot them out, you have this guy and this guy. Both are on the left half of the plane, so you know this is going to be a stable system. Question is, what is the impulse response? Right? If you want to know the impulse response, what do you do? You are in the S domain, you take the inverse Laplace transform, you go into the uh, time domain. Uh, but about this, 60 degrees, how is this 60 degrees? Cosine theta is zeta, zeta is half, theta should be 60 degrees, you can calculate that. 60 degrees, you are omega n away, omega n came out to be 10, right? Omega n was 10, isn't it? Uh, omega n 10, yes, omega n 10, yes. So they're 10 away at 60 degrees, you know what those points are going to be. Minus five plus or minus five square root three. Then you can sort of do, this is omega n 10, this is a damped frequency, 5 square root 3, and, and all those calculations. So you now you know, know the pole 0 plot for the corresponding second order system. Next. Let's try to find the inverse Laplace transform. If you are, are looking for this in, in the standard form, you can just use the tables to do it. For this particular standard form, the inverse Laplace is e to minus alpha t, sine omega t, u of t. And of course, over here, I'm assuming that there are no initial conditions, right? I am just using it as a uh, bilateral system here, bilateral uh, Laplace transform. So H of S was given. I'm going to manipulate that a little bit to make it into the standard form. And I'm going to use the standard form to write my impulse response. So what do I have? I have some amplitude. I have some damping because of that exponential. And I have some sinusoid that is repeating at the certain frequency. Frequency of the oscillations? 5 square root 3, omega t, right, omega d, the damped frequency, some damping involved. So this is a situation where you have damped oscillations in the uh, time domain. So you have damp in the response of your uh, system, impulse response of your system. Uh, now, I have the impulse response. How do I get to the step response? The whole class yells and says, differentiate the step response. You get the impulse response. So you could take the impulse response and get to the step response. It would have damping and it would have sinusoid. Why? Exponential multiplied by sinusoid. Questions about this example? Now, how can this change, right? So how can this change? Your H of S that is given to you may not be in a very standard form, right? So you might, might have to manipulate it or do some partial fraction to make it into that standard form and then you can use the standard results. What are, you, what are you looking for? For it to qualify as a second order system, you need a second order polynomial in the denominator. That's what you're looking for. And you could use all these results for that. All right. Next, I have four parameters that dictate the second order system response. The four uh, parameters are rise time, peak time, settling time, and percentage overshoot. Have you guys seen this in circuits, these four parameters? Okay, so, so my goal over here is not to give you the entire derivation, but I want to give you guys definitely this. One, the results, of course, but also how did we get to the results? So I'll tell you how these derivations were made, and I'll tell you the results. 
So what would be the step response of a second order system look like? In this case, we are looking at a general underdamped second order response. You are giving it, a, the input is unit step. So it's like this. The input is this, a step. The response of this system is start at zero, overshoot, and come back to the final value, which is one, right? So when it overshoots the first time, this is the final value, one, because the input is one, it'll settle down to one eventually. This is called the overshoot. How far away are you from the final value? It is very easy to find the Y max and the peak time. Right. What would be the peak time? Well, take the uh, step response, differentiate it, equate it to zero. For the first time when it get, gets to zero, it would be the time, TP, peak time. And the value of the step response at TP will give you the uh, Y max. Can I see that? I hope you guys are okay with finding TP. Given Y step, given y step of t, right? given the step response in the time domain, differentiate it, equate it to zero, the first time it goes to zero will be the time tp, right? And then the value of the step response at tp will be y max. Next, what is rise time? Rise time is the response going from 10% of the final value to the 90% of the final value. What is the time? That's rise time, 10% to 90%. Next, what is ts? TS is settling time, which means after TS, the response is going to be plus or minus 2% of the final value. Uh, so it means how much time do you need to settle? After that time, you are going to be between plus or minus 2%. Uh, the way you derive the settling time is not by looking at the exact response, but you look at the exponential decay here, like that. And you look at when it when it goes at time at which it goes to two percent of the final value. You pick that as the uh, settling time. So that's your rise time. Peak time is right there. Settling time is time after which it is always going to be plus or minus two percent of the final value. And then percentage overshoot is going to be a percentage of the final value with respect to the overshoot, the maximum. So y max minus y final divided by y final. Go ahead. No, it's not. So it, it's so it, it's an approximation. So uh, you're right. It's it's not the exact one, but the idea is it has to be within two percent of the final value. Go ahead. Right. So. We're not going to link these two. We are actually going to do a exponential. So when you take a look at this, right, you know what that exponential is, right? For the step response or the impulse response, you are going to be able to find that exponential. Once you find that exponential, you take the 2%, right? So 2% of the final value, whatever that is, that will give you TS. So you're not looking at exact values. You're looking at the, the envelope. You, you see that? Again, this derivation is there later on. Wait. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. That, that is bad. So that is why we are not doing the derivations in detail. I'm just going to give you results. Uh, yeah, it is going to be, uh, you are going to have to use product rule of integration to do that. Uh, there was a question. No? All right. Uh, so let me talk about the strategies over here. So those are the four things that we need to find out. Um, so what happens to the step response? Well, let's see. If I, if I have uh, impulse response, right? You see, earlier for the second order system, what was I given? I was given H of S, right? I was given H of S, the, 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 the uh, transfer function of my second order system. I wanted y step. How can I get y step of s, the step response, in the Laplace domain if you are given h of s? How can I get that? In time domain, I'm differentiating, right? So in frequency domain, what am I doing? Well, over, I'm, 
So I'm using this, right? H of T is derivative of Y step, right? So multiply by one over S, exactly. So Y step of S is going to be H of S, but divided by that S factor. H of S is from before the transfer function of the second order system that we looked at. We are just doing the S in the denominator. So now when you factor it out, you get what? Uh, when you evaluate, evaluate it for omega equals one, we are just picking one arbitrary omega and we are writing out the step response in the Laplace domain for this second order system. Now what you can do is you can change zeta and observe what happens to this under damped system. If you have zeta equals 0 0.1, what do you have? You have a big overshoot and then it settles down. As you increase the value of zeta, even go to 0 0.8, what you have is you are getting very, very close to a critically damped situation, right? So as you are increasing zeta, what is happening? You are decreasing the overshoot, right? You're decreasing overshoot and you're moving close to the critically damped case. But also as you're increasing zeta, uh, you are making omega d farther and farther away from omega n, right? The damp frequency and natural frequency, they're gonna be pretty close to each other if zeta is small. More the zeta goes up, you can see this, right? As the frequency is changing, they're not all, all of the same frequency. The frequency is changing slightly. So for a bigger zeta, you are going to get omega d, which is farther away from omega n, natural frequency. Good, uh, next. What is the step response going to be? It's going to be this very complex mess. How did you get it? You took this guy, you did partial fractions, and then you wrote down the, for each partial fraction, so you had three, right? One, one, one over S, one over S minus blah, blah, one over S minus the other one, complex conjugate pole. You had two poles for this guy, you had one pole for this guy. For all of them, partial fractions, then, uh, writing out the inverse Laplace will give you this. Don't need to memorize this, but that is going to be your step response. It has some damping, you can see this, some damping is there and some oscillations are also there. Next, uh, once you have the Y step, you can do all of that TP, you know, finding TP. You can differentiate this, set it to zero and all that. So how do you find TP, the peak time? Well, take the step response. How do you go to step response? H of S, divide by S, partial fraction, inverse Laplace. You got Y step. From Y step, how do you derive peak time? Differentiate it, set it to zero. The first time it happens is going to be at the peak. So the peak time value is derived as this. Again, I don't want to give you guys the exact details about this and this and this and this. You can track the math over here, but what is more important is how did you get it, right? And what is the result? Peak time is that. It is related both to omega n and as well as zeta. Those two are your parameters of the second order system. So this is pretty simple, right? Differentiate, set it to zero. That's how you, very intuitive. And then based on this, TP, if you know TP, you also know Y max. Y max is going to be TP substituted over here, right? You substitute in the step response, that will give you Y max. Percentage overshoot, well, for percentage overshoot, you need two things, Y max and Y final. Y final is going to be one. It'll, that's where it'll settle down to. Y final is one. Y max will be evaluation of the step response at TP. TP I know from before. Y step of T I know from before. Plug TP in there, find Y max, Y final is one, find the percentage overshoot. When you simplify this, that's your result. Percentage overshoot relates only to zeta, no omega n involved. Next. This is a sketch of what happens to the percentage overshoot as you increase zeta. So. If you are over here, there's no damping, then of course you are at 100% overshoot. As you are increasing zeta, that particular overshoot actually goes down exponentially. 
So you are just sketching that particular function, e to the negative zeta pi divided by one minus zeta squared. Increase zeta, decrease percentage overshoot. But increase zeta also means omega d and omega n are farther, farther away. Uh, next, deriving the equation for settling time. This is what I was talking about earlier. So instead of looking at, with the oscillations, you take a look at the envelope. You just look at the exponential here, right? And in, so ignore the oscillations. Just look at the envelope. The envelope has to be less than 2% of the final value. The time for that time that corresponds to that would be your settling time. So that uh, is this 2% is that. Settling time works out to be 4 divided by zeta omega n. Here, both dependence on omega n and zeta. So how can you, how are these equations, how are these results uh, useful? If you are given certain uh, limitations, certain uh, spe specifications for a desired second order system. I want this rise time, I want this uh, peak time, I want this percentage overshoot. You can take those, find the corresponding zeta omega n. You know zeta omega n, you know the poles. You know how to make that system, right? You, you guys see how they are all connected. For a you could be given, you, are, you will not be given specs like these are the poles. The specs will be based on rise time, percentage overshoot and so on. For the and you can now design the corresponding system because you know they will be related to zeta and omega n. All right. Now, in the next one hour or so, I want to talk about feedback systems. And in my opinion, this, uh, this particular lecture, this particular content is probably the most interesting one. Uh, so I hope that you guys are excited about this. A little bit more excitement than what it is right now because I know that you have seen some dry derivations, a lot of math. So hopefully this one will be, be a little bit more straightforward in terms of math, but a little bit more interesting because it will tie the real world to the math. We are going to talk about feedback systems. So if I don't have any feedback, then my system is going to be generally unstable. Uh, as long as I'm not talking about an uh, a pendulum. If I'm talking about pen pendulum, I don't need any feedback. It's going no matter how much disturbance I give it, it's going to come down to a stable system. This is a stable system. But if I talk about an inverted pendulum, then I'm talking about an unstable system, right? So how can I design systems that will make unstable systems into stable systems? I will need feedback. Where do you use feedback? Driving a car, you use feedback, right? Your eyes are your sensors that will give you that feedback information, and you'll use that to accelerate or uh, apply brakes. And you could use that even for drones. If suppose your drones are monitoring altimetry data, like how far away, how high they are right now, you could use that altimeter sensor and you could use that as a feedback signal. Using that, you could adjust the height of the drone. If you wanted it to fly exactly at the same height, then you can use the data, adjust the height, use the data, adjust the height, right? That would be your feedback. You can use that even for uh, temperature control in the room. Use a temperature sensor, adjust the heat. Temperature, heat, temperature, heat. So to maintain a particular temperature in the room. So feedback systems will make your life more convenient. As far as stable uh, systems are concerned, you can use this to make systems stable, even if they are unstable. So what is the process? Well, feedback is a process of measuring a controlled variable. For example, the room temperature or the height of the drone. Uh, and using that informa information to influence the value of the control variable. Using a sensor to measure the room and influencing the heater to control that temperature, to change that temperature. So that's your feedback. In feedback, things could arise naturally. These are not some things that are uh, sort of designed for. They could arise naturally or they could be done purposely. Arising naturally, the example is, audio speakers feeding back into a microphone during a public address. We've talked about this example earlier. It leads to distortion, uncomfortable noise. How can you control it? Well, you reduce the gain of your speaker system to reduce the, that feedback, un uncomfortable noise. So that's where 
the feedback ar arises naturally, but you try to control it purposely. But you could introduce feedback by purpose, on purpose, to make things stable. So to enhance or control some aspect of the system performance, like maintaining the height of a drone, you would introduce feedback purposely. And today we will be looking at trying to stabilize an inverted pendulum by purposely introducing feedback. The main question will be, what type of feedback do you want to introduce? That will be a bigger question. Uh, next, you could also use feedback to make the frequency response of an amplifier a flat response. Why would you want that? Anybody over here that, who, had, who has dealt with amplifier design? Some amplifier design? Digital or uh, analog? A a any an amplifier? So when you are amplifying something, suppose you are amplifying a signal, would you want your amplifier to be, um, what is the word, what is the word, biased? Do we, do we biased to certain frequencies or you would want your amplifier to be unbiased? Any frequency, I will always amplify by 10 dB. Yeah, but generally, you would want your amplifier to be sort of, uh, independent of omega, right? Like you would want that to be consistent for all frequencies because its goal is to amplify. So I'll amplify one hertz and I'll, in the same way, I'll amplify 10 kilohertz. So it should be ideally, right? It's not going to be the case because amplifiers generally have a high pass characteristic. Low, so, sorry, low pass characteristic. They will go low and then as frequency increases, they will drop off. Um, but you would want your amplifiers to have frequency response that is flat. And the idea over here is you could use feedback to get that. Without feedback, they may not be flat in frequency. But with feedback, you could get it done. And I'll talk about the math that supports that. Feedback also commonly used to stabilize unstable systems in which certain disturbances and parameters uh, cannot be accurately specified. So we are gonna take one some, such example today with the inverted pendulum, where you have certain disturbances that are not in the user control, but you would still want the system to be uh, stable. For example, if I just uh, sort of try to balance uh, this pen on my palm of my hand, forget about giving it an, an external disturbance. If I just leave it, it might dr drop off, right? But if I find the perfect symmetry with the center of gravity for this pen, I might just be able to be marginally stable. But what would happen if I give it certain external disturbance? Maybe a simple flick or maybe just a breeze. Some small disturbance will topple it over, right? The idea is, even if there is some external disturbance which is not in the user control, can you stabilize it? Can you, can you move your hand, accelerate your hand in such a way that you balance it out, right? That's the goal. Uh, let's see, the basic tool to analyze linear feedback system, and we are gonna be looking at linear systems here. The basic tool is Laplace transform. For discrete system, the basic tool for feedback systems is Z transform. Today we'll be focused on continuous systems, linear feedback systems using Laplace transform. What do we know about stability? We only know one thing about stability so far. Where are the poles? The poles are in the left half plane. The poles are in the left half plane, you're good. Poles are not in the left half plane, you are looking for trouble. Even if they are on the J omega axis, maybe marginally stable as long as they are not repeated roots. But if you are in the right half plane, you're, dead. you're, you're unstable, right? Uh, so that's the condition that we are going to look for. For stability, we are going to look for the poles of your system to be in the left half plane. So now the bigger question is, you said inverted pendulum on top of a hand. Really, it has poles. Where are the poles, right? So let's try to take a look at that. Where are the poles of this particular system? To do that, first we need to do this. What is that? Can we find the open loop transfer function and a closed loop transfer function for a system that has certain system dynamics going forward and it has certain feedback dynamics going backward. So over here, H of S is system dynamics and G of S is feedback dynamics.
So H of S was already there. I attached feedback to do what? To move my poles in the left half of the plane, right? I'm trying to pick G of S in such a way that for the entire system, the poles are in the left half. If G of S was not there, what would happen? X of T goes in, Y of T comes out. What would be the uh, transfer function? Y of S divided by X of S, right? That is no feedback. That is open loop. So open loop is this guy is not there. It is just this, right? So you have Y of S over here, the Laplace transform of the output. You have X of S over here, Laplace transform of the input. And if you wanted open loop transfer function, I think I write it somewhere here, right? Oh yeah, there it is. Open loop transfer function, which means no feedback, you just take Y of S divided by X of S, you get the H of S, which is your transfer function. But in this case, G of S is not there, no feedback. So the transfer function is simply the open loop transfer function. Next. What you're doing is you're taking that open loop transfer function and saying, let me observe y of t, let me observe the output and use the output through some feedback dynamics to do a negative feedback so that maybe the overall system becomes stable. But what is the overall system here? With the feedback, it is going to be called closed loop transfer function. So for the closed loop transfer function, let us try to derive very quickly what is the what is the uh, transfer function it is also going to be y of s divided by x of s but now it is going to have g of s in there right so let us try to find that what do we do we just write e of t e of t is the time domain signal over here which is what x of t minus r of t so e of t is written as x of t minus r of t. x of t is the input, r of t is the output of this g of s block. Next, e of s is what? Well, take the Laplace transform of this, you take the Laplace transform of this and this. x of s minus r of s. How about on the output side? On the output side, y of s is going to be e of s multiplied by h of s. Right? That's right there. Multiplication in the s domain convolution in the time domain. Next, what is R of S? Well, R of S, the Laplace transform of R of T is simply going to be Y of S multiplied by G of S, which is right here. You guys agree with equation one, two, three? Next, what I wanted is what? Y of S divided by X of S. So if I substitute two, three into one, I get Y of S divided by H of S as x minus y times g. I will have to rearrange so that I eventually get y divided by x, which will simplify to q of s, which is going to be the thing that I use for indicating closed loop transfer function, which is y of s divided by x of s, but it, will, it is now with g of s. It will be g h divided by g times h. There's a very simple way of remembering this. What is that? With negative feedback, the closed loop transfer function will be forward divided by one plus product. Right? H divided by one plus GH. That is going to be okay for negative feedback. For positive feedback, there is going to be a sign change that you'll have to carry through. But the closed loop transfer function over here is what? This guy. H of S divided by one plus G of S, H of S. You want this guy to be stable. If you want this guy to be stable, what do you do? You take the denominator, you set it to zero. I can influence it now. G of S is in there, so I can influence it now. And you would want to design H of S, G of S in such a way that the denominator poles will have negative real parts. That's it. Can you see that? So I can pick G of S in such a way that I have that stability in my system. So you give me H of S that was not stable, I will be able to find the G of S that can make it stable. All right, some uh, applications here for amplifier design, inverse systems, and then we'll talk about the thing that matters to us, which is stabilizing unstable systems. Earlier I said, 
when you design an amplifier, or at least when you're using an amplifier, you would want the frequency response of that amplifier to be uh, unbiased to all frequencies, right? Flat frequency response. You can't say, I will amplify one kilohertz better if the amplifier was, say, 40 dB amplifier. I cannot say, I will amplify one kilohertz by 40 dB, but for 10 kilohertz, I may be just doing 30 dB. Uh, right? You cannot be biased for frequent, different frequency. You would want that to be constant, which is, in other words, independent of omega. So how can you define that? Well, you can use feedback to design that. Let's try to take a look. You have that particular amplifier that is biased to frequency, h of omega present over there. You have some input, you have some output. What you're doing is you are putting an attenuator in feedback with that amplifier. Let us try to see what happens with this. What would be the closed loop transfer function for this guy? Forward divided by one plus product. H divided by one plus K omega, K H, right? We know with negative feedback, we can, we can find the closed loop transfer function. Now, observe this, H of omega, one plus K H of omega. If I make K H of omega too high, what would happen? You have K H of omega that will dominate, which means that you can ignore this guy, this one. H of omega will get canceled out and you will have Q of omega equal to one over K, which is independent of omega. In other words, if you increase the attenuation by a lot, what you're, well, you're giving up the amplification to gain consistency over all frequencies, right? Can you see that? But you're able to get independent of omega with that negative feedback. Uh, the, the problem is you're giving up on that attenuation. Instead of getting 40 dB, inconsistently, you may be able to get 20 dB, but consistently. Questions there? Okay. How can you design inverse systems? So inverse systems are what? I will give you P of S, you give me one over P of S, right? So can we design inverse systems that do exactly the opposite? Yes, with feedback, you can do it. So X of T goes through some system whose transfer function is P of S, you get Y of T. Can you design inverse system? Well, just put, P of S in feedback with some K in the forward path. What is K? Just multiplying by K factor. Like doing nothing to frequency, nothing to S, just multiplying the input by K. But you put P of S in the feedback, you get an inverse system. Let's pro prove that. Q of S, the closed loop transfer function is what? Forward divided by one plus product. K divided by KPS, right? If you make KPS much greater than one, dominate, what do you have? One can get canceled. If one can be ignored, K will get canceled. Q of S will be approximated by one over P of S. I see that? So you get inverse system. By using feedback, you can find a inverse of a system. Now, those were some uh, topics that you could use feedback for, but what we are trying to do is this. We are trying to use it for stabilizing unstable systems. This is a system that we are trying to stabilize, H of S, with the feedback, G of S, negative feedback. What would be the closed loop transfer function? H of S divided by one plus G times H of S. We have derived this earlier. We would want the poles of this closed loop transfer function to have negative real parts. So take a look at the denominator, set it to zero, that's a characteristic equation, the values of S that will, have, that will solve this equation are the poles of the system. And you would want the real part of those poles to be less than zero for stable behavior. Questions here? Three, uh, it is nowhere close to a comprehensive list. You know, just three ideas. Yeah, the last one, the last column is sort of very generic, but to amplify design and for inverse system, just some quick ideas about how you could use negative feedback to make an amplifier independent of frequency and make an inverse system. We'll be dealing with the last column here. All right, so here is the interesting part. You have an inverted pendulum. So imagine there is a cart. There is this cart which can accelerate A of T. It can accelerate in order to balance this particular uh, inverted pendulum. So cart, there is a pendulum on top of it, and the acceleration of the cart 
hopefully is such that theta of 3 theta of t goes to 0 right you would you would want to accelerate right you would want to accelerate in such a way that this guy goes to 0 degrees right so that is vertical you're trying to accelerate the, you, you're trying to move your palm of the hand accelerate it in such a way that it is always vertical meaning theta of t is going to 0 what do you do there measure theta if it is this way accelerate the cart accordingly this way go the other so that it goes the other direction and here and here and here and here right you're trying to balance you're trying to accelerate the cart in such a way that theta of t goes to zero that's the goal what is the length of the pendulum l what is x of t x of t is any external disturbance in terms of angular acceleration it could be coming due to uh, a breeze or it could be somebody flicking the the top of the pendulum some external disturbance which is not in our control so x of t is not in our control which means that x of s is not in our control but what what is in our control here only one thing is in our control here acceleration of the cart right so l is sort of set the length of the pendulum is set theta of t is actually the response right that's the outcome so that is the thing that we are trying to look at the output pass it through the feedback dynamics and use it to accelerate the cart uh, s of t is some uh, distance away from the starting position which is not going to play any role in our uh, mat over here so we can ignore that what he, what is going to play a role is l x of t theta of t well obviously acceleration due to gravity and then the acceleration of the cart itself questions about what the problem is inverted pendulum it is fixed on a cart and you're able to control the acceleration of the cart should the acceleration of the cart be related to theta of t or it should be unrelated to the theta of t related right of course it has to be related otherwise there's no point of feedback right so it has to be related one way of relating a of t is a time function theta of t is one time function right what is the relationship what is the simplest relationship a of t between a of t and theta of t what is the simplest relationship between a of t and theta of t accelerate the cart proportional to the angle a of t equals k theta of t right that would be the simplest it's called what proportional feedback but i can also do better than that i can accelerate the cart depending on rate of change of theta that's called derivative feedback i can also do even better i can change a of t based on theta of t but also the rate of change of theta of t it's called proportional plus derivative feedback in one of those three ways hopefully i should be able to stabilize the system two of the ways are not going to work <laughs> uh, all right so let's see what is the open loop system going to look like well that you have external disturbances you have the system dynamics over here you have that output theta of t theta of t and a of t are not related right you are just randomly arbitrarily accelerating the cart of course it is not stable it is never going to balance upright so open loop system is going to be unstable and we can actually show that uh, using the math uh, but the goal over here is going to be to keep that angle with respect time changing angle you would want that pendulum to be absolutely vertical so theta of t should go to zero by applying the appropriate acceleration you guys okay with the with the motivation here what are we trying to do we are trying to get to the best a of t right how should we get that uh, acceleration and you see over here there's no feedback right what are we trying to design we are trying to design a feedback system over here which we are calling g of s that can use theta of s and give us the best a of s right that's what we are trying to find out feedback dynamics um, all right so let's move forward here so in order to stabilize this system using feedback there are a few steps that are mentioned 
first step is measure theta of t. As soon as you measure theta of t, process through the appropriate feedback dynamics, g of s, use that to control the acceleration of the cart. Keyword is what? Keyword is appropriate feedback dynamics. I don't know them yet, right? Because I, once I know g of s, I know everything about this now, right? So measure theta, use it through the feedback dynamics as a negative feedback to control the cart. Set A of T based on theta. Now, when the feedback system is chosen correctly, the closed loop system is going to be stable, the, which means that the poles are going to be in the left half plane. Question is, what G of S should I use? Now, in order to do this, first we'll start with open system analysis, and then we'll put in the feedback. So first case is, how would this inverted pendulum behave when you don't have any feedback? Unstable, right? Topple over, no matter what I do. Even if I sleep for 10 hours, I don't think I'll be stable enough to balance it. It's gonna to topple over. Next, what are the equations that are going to dictate that? Well, it's just going to be balancing of accelerations. In some course, you see this, right? In your hardware uh, high school physics classes, where do you see balancing of accelerations? No, some course you must see balancing of accelerations. What is the equivalent of like uh, IEA? What is it? Yeah, F equals MA or MG, like balancing accelerations. <laughs> All right. But th there must be some course in which you guys talk about accelerate, balancing accelerations. Yeah, all right. Anyway, some physics class that you may or may not have taken will have this content, which is balancing accelerations at a particular point. So what we have is, a pen, all right, so acceleration due to that theta of t, L second derivative of theta of t should equal G times sinusoid sine of theta of t plus L times x of t minus A times uh, A of t times cosine theta of t. So essentially you have theta of t over here, you have the sine and the cosine component there. Uh, one is with the acceleration, the other guy is with the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, and you're trying to balance that out. So, well, even if you don't understand that, just believe that that is correct write the equation to balance the accelerations for this particular system. Uh, we all know what G is. We all know what theta is. We all know what L is. We all know what X of T is. X of T, external disturbance, not in my control. A of T, acceleration of the card, in my control. Theta of T, the output that I'm trying to measure and adjust based on. L, length of my pendulum. That's it. Now, this is the system, exact but we are going to do it for linear feedback systems. We are trying to linearize the system. How can we linearize the system? Well, I need to get rid of this sine and cosine. How can I get rid of the sine and the cosine function? Make the angle very small. If theta of t is very small, sine x equals x approximately, and cosine x will approximately equal one. So now I'm saying I will be able to track this, I will be able to do this, as long as the deviation from the vertical is small enough, I will be able to accelerate. So I linearize the system. Next, I will put these equations in my equation, right? These conditions back into my original equation. I get this. L second derivative of theta minus G theta equals Lx minus A of T. I can apply Laplace on both sides. When I take the Laplace transform of both sides, what do I get? I get theta of S which is the Laplace transform of theta of t equals one divided by ls squared minus g, right? This is essentially applying Laplace transform of this and then manipulating it to write it in this way, simplifying it to write it this way. 
and then multiplied by L x of s minus a of s. So what we have here is this guy, what is this corresponding to? This corresponds to Laplace transform of combined inputs x and a. However, this guy is simply your open loop system function. x of t, we don't have any control over. The only thing that we can control is a of t. So L x of t minus a of t, that is the Laplace transform of both the inputs. One is in our control, one is without, not in our control. This particular term does have anything input related, which means that it has to do with the system related. In our case, we didn't close it, we still have an open loop, so this has to be open loop transform. Can I see that? So you can think of it as inputs, h of s gives you output, state of s. This is without feedback. Um, where are the, is, is this system stable? How are you going to know that? Take this guy, plot the poles. How many poles are you going to get? ls squared minus g. Two poles. Yeah? Square root of g over l. What does that mean? One is good pole, one is bad pole, right? One is in the left half, good one. The other guy is going to be our unstable pole in the right half. It essentially means when you design a open loop system in which you are not influencing the acceleration using theta, then you have an unstable system. Theta of s still has h of s over here. This is your h of s. And all of these are your inputs. That's how you would say output, right? Output equals h of s multiplied by x of s. In this case, you don't have x of s. You, you, ha you, ha you have both x and a. So Laplace of inputs, combined inputs. Next. So that's what you're writing. H, sorry, for yellow. System dynamics multiplied by the input Laplace transform gives you the output, theta of s. Two poles. We have derived them to be at plus or minus square root of g divided by l, g acceleration due to gravity, l length of the pendulum. Plot it on the pole zero plot, you have got a stable pole there, you have got an unstable pole there. Because of the unstable pole, you have got the unstable system, which means that I cannot do that, right? I cannot, uh, without feedback, I cannot stabilize it. I need some feedback. So I, I will put a closed loop uh, over here. So still have x of t, I still have the same h of s, same open loop transfer function. Output is still theta of t. I'm still measuring theta of t. I want that to be zero. I'm using theta of t through some feedback dynamics, g of s. I need to choose that to make it stable. And the output of g of t will be my acceleration that I will accelerate the cart with so that theta of t goes to zero. Right? So h of s didn't change. It's the same system that I'm trying to stabilize. Same open loop system that I'm trying to stabilize. We can use the overall uh, earlier result here. What is that for? It is for the transfer function of the closed loop, trans, uh, closed loop system. What is the transfer function? Theta of s, right? We say theta of s divided by x of s is forward divided by one plus product h divided by 1 plus h g, right? Rearrange, we just brought the x of s over here to the right-hand side. You've got this, theta of s equals l. Where is this l coming from? Well, that l is coming from that because the input is getting multiplied by l and that goes to h. So that l comes from this guy over here, length of the pendulum. Theta of s equals Everything else is coming from this guy, right? Theta of s equals x of s multiplied by forward divided by one plus product. Everything else is coming from that except for this l, which is the length of the pendulum. Now, our goal over here is choose g of s such that for this, the poles are in the left half plane. 
So far so good. The motivation is there. The, mo the, 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 the goal over here is okay. We are trying to find the best G of S that is possible. We already described the three three options that we are going to, to sort of start off with. The first one is what? Choose feedback dynamics. First approach, proportional feedback. Let us accelerate the cart proportional to the angle theta of t. Bigger the angle, bigger the acceleration. Smaller the angle, smaller the acceleration. All right, let's try to see if we can, we can stabilize with that. Well, if g of s is simply k1, what is a of t? a of t will be k1 times theta of t, right? Acceleration is proportional to the angle that you just measured. If you choose this, will you be able to, will you be able to stabilize? Well, all I have to do is use the same closed loop transfer function, theta of s. Now I know g of s is k1, so I can substitute that over there. I can simplify. My goal is to find the location of the poles. What is the location of the poles here? Well, the location of the poles is actually, there are two poles, plus or minus square root of g minus k1 divided by l. k1, which is the proportionality constant for that feedback, is influencing the location of the poles, right? k1 is influencing the location of the poles. So let's try to see what, what would happen if k, k, k1 is zero. If k1 is zero, we are back to our previous open loop uh, situation, right? The two poles are at the same locations. When k1 is zero, you still have an unstable system. But what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start off at k1 equals zero. You see, this is my starting point. Over here and over here. If k1 is zero, my two poles are at here and here. Question is, I can increase k1, k1 greater than zero. I can decrease k1, k1 less than zero. What is going to happen to the poles as I increase or decrease k1? All I would have to do is this, right? I would have to monitor this. What would happen if k1 is g? What, if, what happens to this, the location of the pole, when I make k1 equal g? Zero, right? So if I make k1 equal g, uh, g both my poles are actually meeting on the vertical axis. They're going to zero, right? And if I increase g even further, what would happen? This would become complex, right? G minus k1 will be, well, g minus k1 will be negative and you're taking the square root of that. They become complex, right? Uh, but if I go low, right, k1 less than zero, what would happen then? If I go k1 less than zero, uh, then I'm still real. I will be real, but I will keep getting square root of g minus g zero divided by l, plus or minus. But I will always have this real pole, the real part being positive in that case. So let's take a, do, take a look. If k1 influences the pole, what I'm trying to sketch out over here is called the root locus. What is the root locus? Root locus is a sketch of how the poles move in the S plane. That's it. Root locus is a plot of how the poles move in the S plane. My starting location is over here, here and here. This is corresponding to K1 equals zero. Of course, there is a pole in the right half plane, so it is unstable. But from here, from the starting point, I have two options. I can increase K or I can decrease K. If I increase K, K1 greater than zero, this pole moves this way, this pole moves this way. So for this guy moving left, it's good news. For this guy moving right, it's actually bad news. But if you increase K more than G, when, when it is G, you are here, right? When, when you increase more than G, what happens? One pole moves up, the other pole moves down. Now you have both the poles that are distinct but on the g omega axis. What, do, what is happening to my system now? Marginal stability, oscillations, right? So it's like, no, 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 no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just doing that, right? Like accelerating, 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 going on forever. That's what that means. If you, that's the best I can do here, by the way, right? That's why the color choice of green, that's the best I can do. The best I can do with proportional feedback is have marginal stability. And even that, happens when k1 is greater than zero. 
forget about k1 less than 0. When you have k1 less than 0, this guy moves right, further right, making it more unstable. This guy moves this way. That's good news for that, but that's bad news overall because there's one pole that is spoiling, making the whole thing unstable. Go ahead. K, K1 has to be more than G to be marginally stable. Exactly right. When it is Z, uh, when it is G, is rightly two two poles are over here, still unstable. It has to be more than G for it to be here and here. Then you have oscillations. Now tell me, if I increase K, right? As I'm increasing K, what am I doing to the damping and the oscillation frequency? So. These are here, right? I increase k, then you went here and you went here. What happened to the frequency? Omega n went up, right? The natural frequency of those oscillations went up, right? You, you guys see that? So when you're going, when you're increasing k, you're actually going up and you're increasing the omega n. How about the zeta? How about the damping? Didn't change, right? Because you are on the semicircle, you're only going up here. You don't, you're not controlling the line. All right, excellent. So that was one way, proportional feedback. Didn't work, right? Didn't work because the best you can do is marginal stability here. You didn't make it stable. So the next option is derivative feedback. So instead of using proportional K1, you use derivative. What that means is A of T, earlier we were not accelerating the cart fast enough. We were not responding fast enough earlier. Now we want to make the acceleration such that we respond to the derivative of change of t to theta of t as opposed to theta of t, so that we hopefully are able to respond fast enough. So if you are trying to do this, k2 theta of t, what that means for g of s is k2 s. You are differentiating in time, multiplying by s in the Laplace domain, right? So if you have this feedback dynamics such that you have k2, some constant k2 times s, what that means for the time domain is you are accelerating the cart proportional to the rate of change of theta as opposed to just theta. What happens to the poles now? Well, the location of the poles are now going to be controlled by K2, right? We using the same equations here, forward divided by one plus product, and then factor, factoring the denominator polynomial, two roots, both now controlled by K2. Now let's sketch the root locus here. Starting pole locations are here and here. What is that for? K2 equals zero, right? If K, you set K2 equals zero here, you get back the same pole locations as you got for the open loop case, there and there. With K2, you have got two options. You can increase K2 or you can decrease K2. If you decrease K2, this guy will move here, bad. This guy will move here, eh, okay, but still moving in the wrong direction here. But if you increase K2 greater than zero, this guy will is green, moving in the good direction. This guy is also moving left in the good direction. So both are good. Problem is, this will never cross over on the left side. What that means is, if you use just derivative feedback, you are not going to get stability. Right? Earlier, you, you were able to get at least marginal stability. Now you are not even going to get uh, marginal stability. What do you have next choice? You did proportional, didn't work. You did derivative, didn't work. Next logical choice, combine them. Proportional plus derivative feedback. How does this look like? Still have the same H of S. Open loop system, it didn't change. But what we changed is the feedback dynamics. So G of S as both proportional and derivative. K1 for proportional feedback and K2S for the derivative feedback. Now I'm changing acceleration based on theta of t as well as rate of change of theta of t. Let us try to see, because I have two parameters that are in my control, K1 and K2, maybe I will be able to make this stable. Let's try to take a look. You start off with the math the same way, theta of s divided by x of s, is going to be forward divided by one plus product. Substitute the G, H of S and G of S from these systems for system dynamics and feedback dynamics. You get a quadratic in the denominator, factorize it, 
find the two location of the poles. Both of them will be dependent on K1 and K2. So you have two things that you can influence. You will use to influence the location of the poles. Let's try to take a look at where those poles are going to be. Now, there is going to be a starting place, and then there is going to be how you can change. So the starting pole locations are make K1 0 and make something K2 greater than 0. Why are you picking this? Well, you see this. If I make, if I, I'm, I'm going back to the derivative feedback case. My starting location is now moved left. Both my poles, the starting location is moved left. So I pick K1 as 0, no contribution from the proportional feedback. But K2 I have increased to some positive value. So my starting location itself, this guy is here, this guy is here, right? So that when I go to the proportional feedback, when I change K1, then this guy can move here, right? You see this, what, what happens here with proportional? They move towards each other and scoot, shoot off in the vertical direction. So if I move the whole thing left first, then I, I'm going to be in the left half plane. You guys see that? So I will pick K1 greater than zero, sorry, I'll pick K1 as zero and K2 to be something positive so that I have my starting location not centered at zero but skewed to the left. Then I will increase K1. When I increase K1 now, this pole moves this way, this pole moves this way, but as soon as it crosses over to the left half plane, it became stable. However, being here and here corresponds to an overdamped system, right? So still there is damping, huge damping. But if I wanted to see some oscillations, I would increase K1 even more. So you would get here and then you would start moving this way, right? So it, as you increase K1 even further, the two poles are going to shoot off in the vertical directions, both of them in the left half, stable, and now you are going to see some oscillations in the system, meaning a little bit of movement is there, right, based on, the, on that. Questions here? You, we were able to make it stable, right? Now, with this, math is tied up, right? But what completes this is a YouTube demo. So hang with me here because I have that pulled up. I think it's, yeah. You guys are able to see this, right? All right. So this is the person teaching signals and systems. You guys recognize who he is? He is Alan Oppenheim, the author of the textbook that is assigned for this course. Uh, he has been teaching signals and systems at MIT for many, many years. This video is recorded from spring 2011. I'm not sure if he's teaching that right now or not, but this is exactly the same demo of the math that we just discussed. What does he have here? He has a inverted pendulum that is on a cart, and he's going to try to implement that same proportional and derivative feedback. So I'm going to play this, and let's See, now he, as he flicks the pendulum, right, the card is adjusting to that. He's able to keep track of changing x of t's. He's changing the x, x of t, external disturbance, and a of t is essentially uh, controlling the motor, right, that, that's driving the card. It's able to take care of the uh, balancing. It's able to make it stable for small. If he wax it, of course, it's, it's going to be unstable, right? So theta of t is small enough. It's a linear system. Now he does some very interesting things. He wants to change x of t, more disturbance. He is going to place this wine glass on top of the inverted pendulum. So he's changing the uh, system a little bit. He's introducing uh, more instability. But this is not big enough for uh, it to be, become unstable. It is still OK. It is still stable. So he'll make it a little bit more interesting. He'll start pouring some liquid in there. And as he does that, all he did was what? Increased damping, right? It was already a system that was stable. He increased damping, so it became more stable. So he has a stable system here. Liquid is not sloshing around. It is you know, it's very calm. It is stable. Uh, but now he is going to increase, he's going to change a few more things. Maybe 2x speed would have been better. So 
so instead of putting the the glass, he just put the entire thing on there, right? So he'll put the entire beaker over there. So X of T is now changed significantly. Things are still stable, but you see what happens. The system will move towards oscillations. You see marginal stability case, right? Like the, 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 the poles have moved to the vertical axis here, close to the vertical axis at least, right? So now what he does to dampen those ex, uh, oscillations is he will pour the liquid back in there. So he's, he'll increase damping to remove the oscillations out. So increase zeta, omega d went to zero. Now the system is stable, no oscillation. Well, he, he, he must have repeated the experiment a couple of times, but this essentially ties the math to how it looks, right? You're seeing oscillations, you're playing, the, the oscill they are oscillations. How can you control them? Increase damping. How can you increase damping? Just pour more liquid in, right? Um, all right, so for me, this was like a very, very interesting lecture. We often, we rarely have cases where we can tie the math to the real world. Uh, so whenever I get a chance of where you can do that, I'll take it. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Next class, what is that? Yeah, I know, but it got public in spring 2011. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Like, in that book, like, we'll just that we just pass those constants out and we don't calculate it. There it is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 